Good afternoon. So um, we again have the second lecture of uh, algebra. So the last time I gave the definition of a group and of a subgroup and some easy examples. And now um, I will want to, uh, to talk about um, uh, cosets for a group as first thing. So if, for that, I will also uh, cosets of a subgroup inside a group. So for this, I first want to briefly review, although I expect you know it, uh, equivalence relations so that we have it, uh, uh, everything in place. So review of uh, equivalence relations. So that is, um, <coughs> so equivalence relations uh, occur very often in uh, mathematics. Whenever we have, uh, we want to maybe somehow identify two things because they are uh, in some, because in some sense they can be identified, and then this is, is due to an equivalence relation. So let us see what this is. First, I say what a relation is. So if A is a set, um, a relation on A is just a subset of the product of A with itself. R on A is just a subset. R contained in A times A. And we, we would maybe denote, uh, we write, say, A is related to B uh, for uh, uh, AB is in R. So this is a kind of such a general uh, concept that it's almost without any use. So now we look at special relations, which are equivalence relations, which allow us in a suitable sense to identify two things if they are uh, related by this relation. So such a relation, so this relation is called an equivalence relation. Uh, if it satisfies two properties, uh, the uh, three properties, the following three axioms hold. So first, everything, every element is related to itself. So A equivalent to A for all A and A. So this is called the uh, called reflexivity. Good. Um, the second one is uh, if A is related to B, then B is related to A. So that's a symmetry. For all A, B in A. And the third one is um, the, in some sense, the most important one because it's the one that is most difficult to check in practice, so which is the transitivity. So if uh, A is related to B and B related to C, then it follows that A is related to C. And we we say that A and B are equivalent if this, uh, if, A, uh, if we have this relation. So say A and B are equivalent if A to B. So as I said, in practice, when you want to show that something is an equivalence relation, you usually find that these first two things are obvious. And the only one where one might have to put some work is the third one. Um, so, <clears throat> and uh, 
then very often in uh, mathematics it happens that one is looking at certain things, you know, certain uh, mathematical objects and one finds that there is an equivalence relation on them and then one will want to identify these objects if they are equivalent, which means that one replaces the set by the set of equivalence classes. Let's see what the, you know, the set of elements equivalent to it. And so we <coughs> will want to introduce this. So first, let's look um, at this stupid example. So uh, for instance, again, we take an element k and z, which is non-zero. Then we say, uh, we define a is equivalent to b if and only if uh, k divides a minus b. So this means divides. <coughs> so, and then you can easily check uh, this is an equivalent solution. And so now, uh, what I want to so if you have an equivalence relation into a set, uh, on a set we find that the set is decomposed into disjoint subsets, the equivalence classes. So one each set will be of the form or the elements which are equivalent to one given element. So an equivalence relation. determines a decomposition, so say on a set A, determines a decomposition of A into disjoint subsets. And these subsets are called the equivalence classes. So let's see how that goes. So I will actually want to, so that means, okay, so I actually will define it. So let A set an equivalence relation so, so the, the equivalence class of an element A in A is, uh, so this is, I denoted by A, which is just the set of all B in A such that A, so say B, B is equivalent to A, okay? So this is the equivalence class, and then the uh, remark, whatever, Um, remark is that um, if we have an equivalence relation, we get a decomposition of uh, A into equivalence classes. So let A be non empty set. Why do we want non empty? Well, whatever. Non empty. Um, and we take. Um, there to be an equivalence relation on it. Um, so the distinct equivalence classes uh, with respect to this equivalence relation form a decomposition of A into disjoint sets. So this is uh, obviously quite trivial. So <clears throat> the first thing is that uh, 
the union of all the equivalence classes. So what is being stated here is that the union of all equivalence classes should be the whole of A, and two such equivalence classes are either equal or disjoint. So we know, after all, by our action, with flexibility, that A is equivalent to A, so thus for every A in A, we have that the class of A contains A as an element. So therefore, A is the union of, of the A with A in A. And the second statement is that they are disjoint. It's also very simple. So uh, either disjoint or equal. So um, let's take um, two elements. So we want to see that they are either disjoint or equal. So let's assume they are uh, not disjoint, so that they, they have a, something in common, then we have to show they are equal. Assume the equivalence class of A intersected the equivalence class of B is non-empty. Okay? So that is, we can take an element in this intersection. And we want to use this to show that they are indeed equal. That A is equal to B. I mean, that the equivalence class of A is equal to the equivalence class of B. So we have that, um, so X lies in A, so it follows that, uh, say, uh, x is equivalent to A, or if you want, A is equivalent to x. And x lies also in B, so we also have uh, x is equivalent to B. So by symmetry and transitivity, we have uh, uh, A is equivalent to x, and x is equivalent to B, so it follows that uh, by transitivity that A is equivalent to B. So, so now assume Y is an element in A. So that means Y is equivalent to A. Then by transitivity, you know, no, using this, we also have that y is equivalent to b. So in other words, y is an element of the class of b. So that means every element of the equivalence class of a is an element of the class, equivalent class of b. So we have shown that a is contained in b. But obviously, the situation is completely symmetric. We could have uh, exchanged the world of a and b and would have gotten the corresponding result that B is uh, contained in A. So therefore, A, so by symmetry, and uh, we have A is equal to B. And so we have shown that uh, if we have two equivalence classes, if they have uh, a non-empty intersection, then they're equal. And that's what we wanted to show. OK, so that was simple. <coughs> Now, um, I should maybe say, <coughs> so just a few more words. So if, um, I don't know whether I want to call this definition, but anyway, so if, uh, so let again, we have a, an equivalence relation on a set A. And uh, so if um, you have an element A in some, equivalence class B, um, then we say 
that uh, A is a representative of B. Actually, in this case, as we have seen, we know that uh, A is equal to B. But anyway, that's not relevant. Um, so what very often happens in kind of uh, the daily life of a mathematician is that you have some, you know, some nice set on which you have some nice structure, and you have an equivalence relation, and you want to somehow have the structure go to the equivalence classes. So the way you usually do this is that you define it in terms of the representatives. So for instance, you want to take uh, the sum of two equivalence classes with respect to some group structures, and you do this by taking the equivalence class of the sum. And uh, this will be, this kind of definition will make sense if and only if it's independent of the choice of uh, the representative. And so, uh, so often we want to define uh, something uh, for equivalence classes. Uh, by making the definition I say it in a rather vague way but I think it's pretty obvious what I mean by making the definition in terms of um, of representatives so this is this will make sense will uh, lead to a valid definition. And one would usually say, one says it is well defined. If this definition is independent of the choice of representatives. So if the definition is independent. Well, that was a B. Of the choice of representatives. And if it's not independent, then this will not be a valid definition. So we can look at a very stupid case, which is related to the previous one. So We had before this equivalence relation, which we had uh, so on. So we have an example on uh, Z. We had this equivalence relation. So we have a, we have chosen an element K, say in Z, which is non-zero, and we have an equivalence relation, which we had just seen that uh, N is equivalent to m uh, if and only if k divides n minus m. This was an equivalence relation, as I had claimed before. So we want to, uh, so I uh, call um, z modulo kz the set of equivalence classes. for this relation. Okay? So, <clears throat> so we have a, a set whose elements are the equivalence classes. And we want to, um, so, so, so the equivalence classes according to this are you know, n for some n in z. So now we want to uh, make this into a group uh, with a somehow using the addition on Z. So define an addition on Z mod KZ by um, 
simplify at n plus m. So if I took to add the class, the equivalence class of n to the equivalence class of m is supposed to, is defined as the equivalence class of n plus m. You know, this a priori does not necessarily make sense because we have defined the sum of these two equivalence classes in terms of the representatives. Oh, I've written n plus m. And if I have, <coughs> but uh, the claim is this is well defined. Because what do we have to see? We have to see that if uh, I have another representative here and another representative here, I get a representative here of the same class. So in other words, if, so to sh we have to see, to see, so if n is equivalent to n prime and m is equivalent to m prime, then it follows that n plus m is equivalent to n prime plus m prime. Well, that means that it's well defined. Well, and that is actually obvious. Because what does it say? So in other words, if k divides n minus n prime and k divides m minus m prime, we want to see that k divides n plus m minus n prime plus m prime. But you know, that's clear, no? This difference is uh, L times k, this is r times k, and this is L plus r times k. So, so <clears throat> this is clear. So this is actually well defined, and one can check with this definition um, z mod kz that's called it is in a BN group. So I mean I mean if you want this is an exercise, so the neutral element will be zero. And the inverse, so I have the notation here. I take the additive notation for this group. So minus n is equal to the class of minus n. You can check that this is true. Anyway, this kind of follows easily from the corresponding property for z. OK. Now, we want to, to look at, um, we have defined what a group is and what a subgroup is, and now we want to see that a subgroup in a group defines us an equivalence relation on the bigger group, and the uh, equivalence classes are the so-called cosets. And uh, we'll study these afterwards and see what we can do with it. So, <coughs> so I'm talking about cosets. So as I said, so if H subset G is a subgroup, then uh, this defines an equivalence relation on G, and the equivalence classes are the, are the so-called cosets. sets, and we will maybe now uh, go to the proper definition. So we have this thing, we have G as a group, H is a subgroup, so we define an equivalence relation uh, 
which I now denote um, a bit different on G as follows. We see that A is congruent to B, so A and B are elements in, in G, is called congruent to B modulo H if and only if, uh, uh, what is it? If I take uh, that there exists, if there exists an element H and H such that, which we do want it, A is equal to B times H. Okay. So whenever I can obtain A from B by multiplying by H, or obviously uh, there's an equivalence relation uh, or the other around, then uh, I call them equivalent. So I say A is congruent to B mod H. So this is an equivalence relation. Well, that's quite easy to see again. So first, obviously, A is equivalent to A itself, mod H. Now we can take our element H here, take H to be 1. No? And A is equal to A times 1. And uh, we also see this is the first property, this is the uh, reflexivity. And then um, we have the symmetry, which is also trivial. So if, um, if A is equal to B times H, then I can, and H is in H, I can multiply uh, by H to the minus 1, and I get that B is equal to H to B to A times H to the minus 1. And if H is an H, then and as H is a subgroup, this is also an H. So we also get that B is congruent to A mod H. So the first two properties are clear. And in this case, also the third one is not really more difficult. So transitivity. So assume that uh, A is congruent to B mod H. So A is equal to B H for some H for some H in H. And B is congruent to C mod H. So B is congruent to C times H prime for some H prime in H. Well, then obviously A is equal to, I mean, we just put it in, um, C H prime H. And H prime H is, a pro is as a product of two elements. And H is an element of H. So this is an equivalence relation. So. <clears throat> Yeah, that's all not very exciting, but OK. So the equivalence classes are called the cosets. Uh, are called cosets. So I write it more correctly, definition. Um, so let H be sub. G uh, then so for every every element A in G we call the set say AH which is just you know somehow 
what looks like it's written here, every product of an element of A, of A with an element of H, so A times H, where H is an element in H, is called a right, a left coset. <laughs> yeah. It's always kind of, uh, I find it always, I mean, it's how it's called, although I always find it strange because the H lies on the, is on the right, but that's the way it's called. So it's called um, a left coset, a left coset of H in G. So you can see um, by the definition we gave before that the coset of A is precisely equal to the equivalence class to, of this recurrence relation. So by the above, so with respect to the above uh, equivalence relation, we have that AH is the equivalence class of A. And it's clear by definition that uh, if I take the equivalence class, so of the coset of one, this is just H. So we have, a, we have these, uh, the decomposition of G into equivalence classes. And one of these, so which are these cosets, one of them is actually equal to H. And now the next thing we will see uh, that all the equivalence cl classes you know, have the same number of elements in a suitable sense. They are all bijective to each other. So they are all as big as the subgroup H. So remark. So let AH and BH be two cosets. I mean, left, but I. For, so this is called a left coset, but I will only consider left coset. So from now on, they are just called cosets. So let AB be two cosets of H and G. Then. I claim they are bijective to each other. So we have a map from AH to BH, which sends just, you know, for any H and H, the element A small h to B small h is a bijection. So H and H is a bijection. Okay. I mean, by definition, if, um, <clears throat> and that's very simple, I can write down what this map is. It's just, um, this map is just the, in a suitable sense, the multiplication. So how is it? It's B. It's the multiplication from this side by B A to the minus one. So, because uh, you know, you can see this map is given by multiplying any element here with B times A to the minus one, and so this will certainly send any element A H to the corresponding B H, and uh, it is a bijection. because we can obviously give its inverse. Is the multiplication well by the inverse element, so by a b to the minus 1. So if I have any element in a h, first I multiply it by this, I get the AH is sent to BH, and then I apply this, it's back, sent back to AH. So this is the bijection in both directions. So we find that 
any two cosets are bijective to each other. So in particular, if the group is finite, um, or if the cosets are finite, uh, or if only the cosets are finite, they have the same number of elements. So, uh, and so this allows us to make some kind of simple counting argument. It's all not very. So, definition. Let uh, G be a group, H a subgroup. So we say the, the index of H in G is, um, oh no, I don't want to say that now. So then we denote, so the set um, so the set um, of uh, uh, cosets of H in G is uh, denoted uh, G watch H, we call it uh, the quotient set of G by H. And uh, so it contains, uh, so by definition, G mod H is the set of all A H with A and G. And the order of this group, or this set, so the number of elements, so the set, the number G mod H, so uh, the index of H and G is um, uh, the number of elements of the set with the usual convention that we write it's, it's infinite if uh, this is not a finite set. So with uh, and so is, so I should say it's, it is denoted uh, G H and defined to be the number of elements in this quotient set. And uh, so when where we say that this index is infinite equal to infinity if G mod H is infinite set. Okay. So it can certainly happen that uh, G, both G and H, so if G is finite, then uh, certainly the index of any subgroup will also be finite. If G is infinite, it can be that there are some subgroups which are also infinite for which the finite, for which the index is finite. So for instance, example, can look at our stupid example that we have kind of always used of Z mod K. So if we have, a, so let, uh, so if K is an element of Z without zero, and maybe for simplicity, I assume that it's actually positive. Uh, then we know that KZ is a subgroup of um, <coughs> um, of Z, and we can form uh, the quotient set. So. Uh, quotient set is uh, Z mod KZ. And you should notice that this is precisely the set which before I had defined Z mod KZ 
in a different way. I had said that uh, Z mod KZ is uh, the quotient of, of Z by the equivalence relation, where we say that two elements uh, N and M are equivalent if the difference is divisible by K. But this, uh, you can easily check that this is the same statement, uh, uh, that this is the same as the quotient by this subgroup. So uh, note uh, this is the same definition. as in the previous example. Because KZ is just the set of elements in Z which are divisible by K. And so then you find that the, uh, the two definitions I gave for this are the same. The quotient set is this, and you can check easily that um, uh, this is a finite set. So Z mod KZ is equal to the equivalence class of zero, one until K minus one. No, because if um, we have any element which is, for instance, larger than K, we can do division with rest, and we get an element which is equivalent to it, which is always in the same class as one of these. And so this quotient set is indeed finite. And the, so the index, so in other words, we find that the index of KZ in Z is equal to K, as one would maybe also expect. OK, now <coughs> we get our first theorem, which is uh, not very <laughs> difficult to say the very least, but it's, um, <coughs> it's still, it's a theorem because it's useful. Um, and it uh, was maybe, it even has a name to it, it's the theorem of Lagrange. So let G be a finite group. and H be a subgroup. Then the number of elements of H divides that of G. So then H, so which one can also call, which was also called the order of H, divides G. So this, I remind you, means divides. Well, first, that's still right. So which is also the order of G. So the order of any subgroup divides the order of the group. And uh, to make it more precisely, uh, more precisely, we have that the order of G is equal to the order of H times the index of H and G. OK, so this is a bit, <clears throat> I've called this theorem, but it's actually quite obvious. But it's called a theorem because it's quite useful. So let's see <clears throat> first how one sees it. So we just use what we have here. So we have that. Uh, G has a decomposition into equivalence class into cosets. So we know that G has a decomposition into cosets. So we have, um, uh, and in fact, the number of cosets is G mod H is uh, this uh, index, and they are into G mod H disjoint cosets. 
So in order to prove that this identity holds, we only need to see that all cosets have H, have as many elements. But we know that already because we have seen that one of the cosets is actually equal to H, and all cosets have the same number of elements. So, so H is a coset, and all cosets have the same number of elements. So it follows that the number of elements in G is equal to the number of elements in H times G times the index. OK, so this is, as I said, fairly obvious. But uh, <coughs> I mean, one must say, maybe to the defense of Lagrange, that he was one of the inventors of group theory. So <laughs> can, uh, but and it's also really useful. <coughs> And you know, I think, uh, again, this was invented for the use in Galois theory, and it's an important little fact. We, I will give some corollaries to show that this is somehow useful. So the first one is, uh, so some corollaries. So first I define the order of an element. Let uh, A in G be an element in a group, where G is a finite group. And um, so, no, I don't need that. So A is an element in a group, G is a group. I'm in a moment making definition, not the statement. So the order of G, so the order of A. which is the smallest uh, positive power of A such that you get 1. So it's the equal to the minimum of uh, all n positive integers such that A to the n is equal to 1 if such an n exists. such n exists, and uh, it's infinity otherwise. So in particular, for instance, uh, differently from a very annoying misprint in my notes, the order of 1 is 1. And, uh, <coughs> Uh, for every element in the group. And obviously, if G is a finite group, you will find that the order of any, every element is finite. Let's see. Uh, in particular, we get the following statement, corollary. Uh, let G be a finite group. And I take an element A, let A in an element in G, uh, then the order of G of A divides the order of G. Well, it's not so. So what we actually, <coughs> I mean, it's kind of clear how one would, would want to prove that, you want to see that the subgroup generated by A contains precisely all of A elements. And then, so as it's a subgroup, we use this thing. And so uh, it has to divide the order of the group. So let's see. Again. Ah, it 
faster. So let A be the cyclic subgroup which we introduced the other time. The cyclic subgroup of G generated by A. So it's enough to show that this has uh, as many elements because it's a subgroup, no? So enough to show. The number of elements in this subgroup is equal to the order of A. Because as it's a subgroup, we know its number of elements divides the order of G. And so that's it. So, <clears throat> well, that's not very, let's see. So you might remember what this was. We have that A is equal to the set of all A to the N, where N is an element in Z. So not generated, it's this set. And A to the N will meant uh, multiplying A with itself N times, or if the N is negative, multiplying the inverse of A with itself N times, as you had introduced yesterday. So now we employ, so in Z, we have division with rest. So by, uh, you know, by this number, order of E. Of e. So that is, we can write N. So we can write N. N equal to uh, some number D times order of A plus the rest where d is an integer, and uh, r is an integer between 0 and this number minus 1. No? Everybody, this you learn, I don't know, maybe in the third class or in the fifth class or something. School, and uh, so <coughs> um, uh, so. What does it mean for this? So, if I take a to the n, this I can write as a to the d times the order of a plus r, and. Um, I can also write the other round. So this is the same as uh, a to the order of a to the power d. Times a to the r. Now, a to the order of a is equal to 1. So this is 1. This is equal to a to the r. So we find. So therefore, for each n in, in Z, a to the n can, is equal to a to the r for r, an, an integer from 0 to order of a minus 1. So we find that this set here, so, OK. So we see that a is equal to uh, so one a a squared a to the r uh, out of a minus one. So what we have the only thing we have not yet seen is that these elements are really all different. So we have precisely a out of a elements. We want to see that they are different. To see they are all different.
then the number of elements in A is precisely order of A. Well, so if A to the R1 is equal to A to the R2 uh, with, uh, say, 0 smaller equal to R1, smaller than R2, smaller. Um, then out of A, or maybe I write like this. <coughs> then what do we have? Well, then we have, obviously, we can divide by the other. We get A to the R1 minus R2 is equal to 1. And we also have that, um, uh, uh, no, R2 minus R1, I want. And we have that, uh, obviously, 0 is smaller equal to R2 minus R1 is smaller than the odd of A. No, because uh, we have subtracted the smaller one from the bigger one. And so uh, we know, however, that uh, this odd of A is the smallest uh, integer such that we get 1. I mean, the smallest positive integer. So it follows that this number must be 0. We get R2 is equal to R1. In other words, uh, or we get, uh, so see, I want to say R2 minus R1 is equal to 0. So in other words, A to R1 is equal to A. So R1 is equal to R2. So we see, therefore, that A consists of odd of A elements, of these elements, and all of them are different. So the number of elements in A is odd of A. Okay, so this uh, then actually shows that the order of any element in a finite group divides the order of the group. It's not very. So, another such uh, simple corollary is that uh, you know, this basically follows if we, in particular, we, if we take any element in a group and we take it uh, in a finite group, we take it as a, to the power of the order of the group, we get always 1. This is also corollary. So let G be a finite group. Um, and A, an element in G then uh, if we take A to the order of G, so number of elements in G, this is to 1. This is uh, something which one uses quite often, but it's obviously quite easy to see. So proof. So by the previous corollary, we have that the order of A divides the order of G. So we can write the order of G as some number D times the order of A, where D is a positive integer. Well, and so if I take A to the order of G. This will be A to the order of A to the power D. But A to the order of A is already 1. So this is quite easily the case. But this, uh, you know, does play uh, a role in some arguments also in Anyway, so this was this. Do we have some more? Well, then finally, 
something about the structure of groups, which is, again, is a very easy corollary. So obviously, it's difficult to know for a general group what all the subgroups are, also for a general finite group. But uh, if uh, the number of elements in the group is a prime number, uh, then we know, because then there's essentially none. So corollary. So let G be a finite group. Um, such that the order of the group is equal to P, where P is a prime number. So I expect you know what a prime number is. So that's a number, an inter a positive integer different from 1, which is only divisible by itself and 1. Um, uh, then uh, yeah, G. So for one thing, I wanted to say that G has basically no. So the only subgroups of G are G and the trivial group. But uh, actually, we can say a bit more. Then G is cyclic. So we can precisely see uh, what kind of group it is. So. Um, This is very simple. So what does it mean to be cyclic? It means that there, that there is an element in G that G is equal to the cyclic subgroup of G generated by that element. But in this particular case, it's very easy. We just take any element, which doesn't happen to be 1, and then the subgroup generated by it will already be G because there's no room for other subgroups. So, so so, um, so SG, so, so for any subgroup, H in G, um, we must have, we have the number of elements in H divides the number of elements in G, which is P. But as P is a prime number, it means that the number of elements in H either is 1, which means that H is a trivial subgroup, or it has the same number of elements. It has the number of elements as P, which means that H is G. Okay, so there are not so many subgroups. <clears throat> and so now let's take any element with A be an element in G, which is not a neutral element, then uh, if I take the subgroup, the cyclic subgroup generated by A, this is a subgroup of G. And uh, it contains an element which is different from 1, so which is different from H, different from the trivial subgroup. So by what we have just said, it follows that A, this subgroup is equal to the whole group. OK, and so G is cyclic. OK, so this was this uh, simple statement. So, so much uh, for the moment about groups and subgroups and uh, um, and uh, the uh, co-sets and the quotient set by subgroup. So uh, are there any questions to this or comments? What? No. So is there anything, have I already told you until now anything that you didn't know before or not?
to nobody? Anyway, okay. <laughs> what? Nothing new. Nothing new. But is it okay all the same? Or, I mean, I hope we will soon come to something new. And, and not maybe for everybody. I mean, if somebody has uh, studied everything, then there will be nothing new. But I think, so now we want to talk about um, mm, uh, normal subgroups and quotient groups. So um, we had, if we have a, if G is a group, and H is a subgroup, we have the quotient set G mod H. And I mean, a natural thing that you could ask yourself is, is this, again, a group? So is this, in a natural way, And it's kind of, you know, in a natural way means one wants to do the obvious thing and it should become a group. So what is the obvious thing? I mean, it's kind of clear. So we would want to define, uh, want to define uh, the group structure on this quotient set by saying that AH times BH would want to define this as a times B, H. No? Now, <clears throat> obviously, but as I told you, uh, you know, this is again a definition in terms of representatives. So in order for this to be a valid definition, we would have to see that it's independent of the representative. So have to see. So, to make this into definition, should be independent of representatives. And so we can ask ourselves, um, uh, so, <clears throat> so otherwise it's uh, not a definition, but just nonsense. So um, let's see. So let's check. Uh, so the, the point is that, uh, uh, I mean, that, I, that we will see, is that uh, this will not always be well defined. So in general, this will depend on the representatives, and so this is not a definition. But if we put an extra, an extra condition on the subgroups, which makes them, and such subgroups we call normal subgroups, then this is well defined. So we can easily see uh, that, this will, uh, that we need some condition by looking at some example. So uh, for instance, if we put, um, say, uh, what do I want? Uh, A, so the element A equal to the 1. The, so what we want, so thus we need. So I, I have to explain. So thus we need, you know, that if AH is equal to BH, so A prime H and B H is equal to B prime H, then it follows that A B H is equivalent to A prime B prime H. 
or that if a. <coughs> so let's just look at an example. So assume that we take a to be 1, a prime to be h, which is certainly fine because they are a1 and any element, and this is an arbitrary element in h. And we take um, uh, just uh, say what we do. We take b, any element in g, an arbitrary element, and b prime equal to b. So we look at just one special case to get some uh, to see whether already here we find the condition on h. So, so, so we, we, so we want that in this case that uh, a b h so b h is equal to a prime b prime h so this is h b h. And B is an arbitrary element of G, and H is an arbitrary element of H. So what, so in other words, there exists an H prime in H such that uh, HB, so this one, is equal so it's maybe not so easy to distinguish, but anyway, H B is equal to B H prime. Well, if this is the case, it follows that um, I can multiply by B to the minus one on this side. So it follows that um, uh, H prime is equal to uh, b to the minus 1 h b. So in this case, but remember that b in g was arbitrary, and uh, h in h was arbitrary. So we actually have found a condition namely, we have that uh, for all h in h, and all b in g, we have um, that if you want b to the minus 1 h b is again in h, or I can replace b by b to the minus 1, we want that b h b to the minus 1 is an element in h. So in order so that we have a chance, uh, I mean, we haven't proven that. This gives us a group structure on the quotient, but in order so that we have the smallest chance that there is such a group structure on the quotient, we need this condition. And groups which, uh, which subgroups which satisfy this condition we call normal subgroups. And then we will see that this condition is also sufficient. Let G be a group. H a subgroup. Uh, then um, we H is called a normal subgroup. G if uh, this condition holds. So if, say, A, H, A to the minus 1, 
is an element of H for all A in G and all uh, H in H. Okay. <coughs> so, so we'll see. Let's first see that uh, there are thing, there are some normal subgroups and there are some groups which are not normal. So, example. Certainly, if G is abelian, G is commutative, then all subgroups are normal. This is obvious because if it's commutative, then a commutes with H, so A H, A to the minus 1 is just equal to H, and H was an H. So this is kind of clear. And let's look at one example of a subgroup. Uh, well, maybe just as a further example. So if we take the trivial subgroup and the whole of G, some kind of the stupid subgroups of G are normal subgroups. Of G. In fact, um, you know, we are not going to use this. Uh, there are groups, I mean, there are many groups which have the property that the only normal subgroups of the group are 1 and the whole of G. And such subgroups are called simple. And one of the biggest uh, results in group theory uh, of the last century is to uh, uh, give a complete classification of all finite simple groups. Um, <clears throat> and the third one is if that uh, G, so let us just look at a simple example. So G, uh, assume that G is equal to S3. So let's look, uh, so, we, so just the uh, permutations of uh, three letters, symmetric group of three letters. So then we take a subgroup H to be the group, a group with two elements. So first, as, as a subgroup, it has to contain the identity, so which is the identity element. Another one is uh, what is called a transposition. So I... Um, You know, exchange three and two, two and three. So this is a subgroup. And why is it a? So we, you can easily check. So it's uh, straightforward to see that if I take one, two, three, if I take this element and multiply it by, it by itself then I get the identity. So this will give me the trivial transposition. I mean, you can just look, no? One goes to one, and then it goes again to one. Three go two goes to three, and then three goes to two, and three goes to two, and two goes to three. So it's this. Um, so this means, first, that uh, that means two things. One thing that... Uh, this uh, set is uh, closed under multiplication. If I multiply any, anything by E, I get the thing back. If I multiply this by itself, I get the identity. So this is a, a subset which is closed under multiplication. And we see that this thing, we have a neutral element, which is E. And the inverse of, uh, uh, and the inverse of, uh, so the inverse of E is E. And the inverse of this element is the element itself because if I multiply it by itself, I get the identity. So this H is a subgroup inverse of um, uh, uh, 1, 2, 3, 
one, three, two is the same element. And obviously, in the same way, we'll do here. Obviously, in the same way, if I take uh, 1, 2, 3, 2, 1, 3, and I multiply it with itself, this again will be the identity element. No? So uh, then we can compute, if we look at this element, 1, 2, 3, 2, 1, 3, and I uh, multiply it with uh, this element here in the group, and I multiply it with the inverse of this element, well, remember that the inverse of this element is the element itself. then we can just compute. So this would be 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3. Ah, I'm not yet finished, to 3. And 3 goes to 3, so I actually was finished. And then 2 goes to 1, 1 goes to 1, and 1 goes to 2. Uh -huh. And um, 3 goes to 3, 3 goes to 2, and 2 goes to 1. And you see, this is um, an element which uh, is not, in, this is not an element in H. So uh, we have found that uh, indeed uh, uh, this is H is not a normal subgroup. still try. So now we want to actually show that what I, you know, what we, what was the purpose of defining a normal subgroup, namely that if we divide by it, we still get a, the quotient set as a group, that this actually is true. So maybe I don't call it this way, I call it opposition. subgroup um, then the quotient G mod H is a group with the obvious uh, group law with multiplication um, a H times B H is equal to A B H. And um, well, so this is quite simple. We only have to prove that the product is well defined. In some sense, we essentially already did this when we motivated the definition of normal subgroup, but let's do it properly. So we take some elements, let A, B, uh, the elements in G, and let, so maybe I say A prime, B prime, the elements in G, such and A with uh, A H is equal to A prime H, H is equal to B prime H. So that means that 
that A is equal to A prime times H for some small H in H, and B is equal to B prime times H prime for some H prime in H. Well, and then we want to somehow so see that A, B, and A prime, B prime are related. So if we take A, B, this is uh, by what we see A prime H times B prime H prime. Now we, we can remove the brackets and we can multiply by B prime, B prime to the minus one, which is just one. Is this what I want? I hope so. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> this is, um, you know, we have an uh, element in H. We have taken the element to the minus 1 times H times this. So this is some element in H. So this is equal to A prime, B prime, H double prime, H prime. So this is a product of two elements in H. So this means that, uh, so H prime, H prime is an element in H. So thus, A, B, H is equal to A prime, B prime, H. OK, so that's quite simple. <laughs> and the rest, so once it's well defined, the, the rest of the, that it's actually a group is kind of obvious. So, so it's uh, clear. So that we take the, so the associativity is clear. Uh, follows from that of the group G. I can kind of write it out. So if we take uh, A H times B H times C H, well, this is by what we have now A B H times C H, and this is done by multiplying by this. So this is A B C times h. And now you can see, we already don't see the bracket anymore, so we can go backwards on the other side. So after some steps, we get that's a h times b h times c h. And uh, the neutral element clearly is, is 1 times h, which is equal to h. Because, you know, if I take A times H times 1 times H, we get A times H. And the inverse to A times H is A to the minus 1 H. So this is certainly a group. So maybe... Uh, I should stop now. So I think, you know, okay, so maybe even that was not new, but <laughs> so I hope you will have some. But is it really, um, well, anyway, so for now it's uh, enough. So next time I will um, work a little bit more with these quotient groups, and I will also then talk about homomorphisms of groups and uh, use them. Okay. Thank you.